Greetings. Welcome back to another Truth Factor discussion. My name is John Duvall. We'd like to thank you so much for joining us for our Bible study. All right, gentlemen, we are continuing in our study, having taken, had to take a break last week. So we're going to be starting here in just a few minutes in John chapter 7, verse 32. I need to pause and fix one issue on my end. Brian, how's your morning going today? Just fantastic. It's a little warmer here in Oregon than we're used to, um, but I can't complain to either of you because you'll laugh at me if I tell you what too warm is here. So I'll just say for us, it's a warm day. We need something good to laugh at. Yeah. Well, John, uh, Brian, you're always good for a laugh, just showing up. Just showing up, just looking like I do. Yeah. I like that. That's true. Bear with me just a moment. Yeah, here in Oregon, we have such nice, uh, mild summers. Uh, so when it gets close to 100, it's over for us. We're, you know, we don't, we run around like our, with our heads cut off and like chickens with a head cut off. And um, it's just not something we're used to. So what is 65? Yeah, 65. No, it, it'll, it'll get, like I said, it'll get up to, it's about 95 today. And that's, uh, that's, whew, for us, we're, we're worried. We're, we're going to cancel school today kind of thing. So. I guess it's humid out there on the West Coast. No, it's, it's really not. You, I, you would think it is, right? But uh, for one thing, summer is our dry season. So we're not getting, we don't get a lot of rain, not a lot of moisture in the air. So it's actually not, again, the weather here is, I think, uh, it's not quite Southern California nice, but it's as nice as it comes. We have mild winters, mild summers. But what gets everybody is it's overcast all for for six months you know it's uh there's it's gloomy for six months so. and it never rains in california but it pours yeah that's right <laughs> all right let's see tom may join us today he, he may be running a few minutes late paul is having internet issues so he won't be able to join us today at least not in a timely fashion so We'd like to thank you for joining us for our study today. Make a quick uh, plug here. If you have any questions or comments, you can send them to us. Send it to questions at truthfactorlive.com. Or you can send us email individually. You see on the screen there, but questions at truthfactorlive.com. If you have joined us on our Facebook page, then please feel free to use the comment section connected with this live video stream to let us know what you have to think. Um, as we study through the Gospel of John, we'd love to hear your thoughts and your questions as well. If you are on our YouTube channel, then use the chat area, of course, connected with this live video stream, and share your thoughts with us also. All right, gentlemen, uh, we left off last week having finished in John chapter 6, verse 31. What i like to do, um, Bob, I think what we'll do is in our reading, let's back up to verse... Um, 30 and it's not the best starting point but i think 31 is necessary to uh what we're seeing in verse 32 and so let's read beginning in verse 30 down to verse 36 if you now would you there, said sir. chapter six but you meant chapter seven right yeah i did i did mean chapter seven you're right chapter seven 30 through 30. i knew that brian would know and tom would know but for the benefit of those at home all right, 31 or 33 foot. Let's go 30 through 36. All right. New King James Version. Therefore, they sought to take him, but no one laid a hand on him because his hour had not yet come. And many of the people believed in him and said, when the Christ comes, will he do more, do more signs than those which this man has done? The Pharisees heard the crowd murmuring these things concerning him, and the Pharisees and the chief priests sent officers to take him. Then Jesus said to them, I shall be with you a little while longer, and then I go to him who sent me. You will seek me and not find me, and where I am you cannot come. Then the Jews said among themselves, Where does he intend to go that we shall not find him? Does he intend to go to the dispersion among Greeks and teach the Greeks? What is this thing that he said, you will seek me and not find me, and where I am, you cannot come? All right, thank you, Mr. Bob. 
All right, so a couple of things here to take note of. Verse 31, there were many people, of course, that believed, and their words were, when the Christ comes, will he do more signs than these, which this man has done. And we talked about that two weeks ago um, in our study. So, Bob, it sounds like other people heard this comment, heard the, the murmuring of the crowd. And it looks like it caused a bit of concern, didn't it? Yes, it did. The very idea that, that some people believed in uh, was enough to upset the Pharisees. They didn't care yeah. how many or how few. They just they didn't want anybody to believe it. Yeah. Is this this is not really the first point that we've seen them deciding to take Jesus, is it? No, it is not. I think uh, maybe not in John, but in, in Luke, was it? They thought that uh, sought to throw him over a cliff. Yeah, I think you're right. Yeah. Wow, Luke chapter four. Luke four. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Luke he chapter didn't waste four. time in making them mad, or right. more threatened, feel threatened, I should say. Yeah. Hey, Tom's with us. Where did you come from? I finally got my business taken care of, so All I, right. I, I should be with you for the remainder of the show. We'll wait and see. <laughs> Well, it's all down here or uphill from here, however the term applies. Anyway, go ahead, Bob. Here's another thought about a question we had posed earlier mm -hmm. in our study of chapter seven uh, regarding his statement to his brothers, I go not, but then he went. I'm thinking, as, as I mentioned then, he's talking about not going with the party of his family. But here is maybe a reason why he's not going with them. He doesn't want them to be subjected to the kind of treatment he's going to be subjected to. And so he's looking out for them by not going up with the family, but going up with his disciples. Hmm. That's an interesting point. I hadn't thought of that. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe I'd ultimately to protect to keep them out of the fray yeah oh i'm i'm going to start losing my hair now <laughs> all right so continuing then he says i shall be with you a little while longer and then i go to him who sent me you'll seek me and not find me and where i am you cannot come john does really good about telling us what jesus is referencing a little bit later, he's going to make a statement about out of you will flow rivers of living water. And John will say he's talking about the Holy Spirit. And we'll talk about that when, when we get there. But in this case in point, is he talking about his crucifixion? Or is he talking about him escaping from them or what? I think he's talking about his return to heaven after the passion. I think that would be the most logical answer there most scriptural answer there. But they didn't know this, did they? They didn't understand his they comment, you will seek me, yeah, and not find me. Yeah, and especially the latter part, where I am, you cannot come. Right. Yeah. Um, what did, oh, so verse 35, I thought this was interesting, and Brian, what does he mean? Does he intend to go to the dispersion among the Greeks and teach the Greeks? How right were they, and they didn't realize it? That he would be taught among the Greeks, uh, that he would be taught among the, um, you know, uh, uh, among the dispersion. I mean, that is kind of interesting. You know, later in the next chapter, they're going to ask the same thing when he says, I'm going to go. And they're going to say, this time they'll say, well, is he going to kill himself? You know, uh, yeah. there's a real uh, a real question about what is he saying when he's saying he's going to leave? You know, he's going he's gonna to quit. Um, I always think it's interesting, too, to think these are the people that believe in him. And it might kind of make a panic. It'd be like, you know, uh, if Tom got up in front of the congregation and says, you guys aren't going to have me here much longer, uh, everybody's going to say, what's Tom going to do? Is he quitting? Is he sick? Is You know, it would really cause some stir, if, especially, you know, Tom's an okay-liked preacher, you might say. And so, you know, if you really uh, were, you know, and these are the people that believe in Jesus, so they're the ones that are the most anxious for, for that. So, you know, if, if people really care about you, they'd be really anxious about this to some degree. What what are you planning to do if you're not going to be with us? You um, know, that would be tough. Concerning yeah. the dispersion, uh, Paul does write to Timothy uh, regarding the gospel, the, what might be considered the first uh, 
the first confession in first Timothy chapter three and verse uh, 16 and without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifested in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen by angels, preached among the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up in glory. For Jesus did not go among the Gentiles and preach, but he was preached among the Gentiles by his disciples. And that is the sense in which he did indeed, indeed intend to go to the dispersion uh, and teach the Greeks, not personally, but through the inspired apostles and prophets that he would send out. Okay. Um, Tom, you got any thoughts you want to share? Oh, no, not a whole lot. I, I, I just inserted a comment. It's interesting. First Peter one, one, uh, first Peter one, one, as he begins his letter, he begins to the pilgrims of the dispersion in Pontius, yeah. Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, Bithynia. Now, of course there's debate. Is that the, is that talking about the Jews who were among them? Is it talking about all of them? Uh, or Jews and Gentiles alike. And when you go through the book of First Peter, uh, obviously there's understanding of Judaism, but it, it at, at I don't know if I want to use the word at best. I mean, mm -hmm. the congregation is clearly mixed. Yeah. So I'm having an issue with the stream for the people at home. I'm not quite certain how this is coming over. Um, I'm getting some warning signs. So... Um, if we lose the connection, we'll keep the study going so we can finish it up um, and have a complete study for today. But hopefully whatever's causing the issue, it could be what Paul's suffering from. Maybe it's contagious um, and he slipped a, a bug in there when he sent us that text earlier. So, okay. That being said, just kind of keep that in mind, guys. If we do lose a stream, we'll keep going with our study and then we'll post it. Um, I'll get it uploaded later. But... Okay, so I thought that was interesting that in their, in their discussing, trying to figure out what he's talking about, maybe they thought he was going to quit preaching in Galilee, quit preaching in that area and go elsewhere in his ministry. But that's, of course, not what happened. That's not what he's talking about. We know that. So he says, what is this thing that he said, or they ask, what is this thing he said, you will seek me and not find me, and where I am, you cannot come. Okay, so in this case in point, right away, we are thinking, all right, well, he'll go to heaven, they won't be able to find him. But isn't there, could there not be more to this statement? It's not simply that people could not go to him, but they are not going to find him because they're not of the right mindset. They're not accepting him as the son of God. Could this be a statement more towards, by him, more towards their own heart and their, their stubbornness? Yeah, he talks about, in chapter 8, he talks about you search the scriptures because in them you think you have eternal life, but I am the eternal life. Yeah. Uh, and so uh, I, that may be, you seek me not knowing that he was the one they were seeking. Yeah, and, exactly. Uh, and not find me. Yeah. Because you're looking point. in the wrong place, you're looking for the wrong person. It does, it does touch back indirectly to the whole discussion of manna. You know, what God had sent and what Jesus truly was, but yet they weren't willing to accept him as a manna yeah. from heaven. Yeah. Chapter okay. six. Ex exactly. Yeah, chapter six there. All right, let me see if we've got any questions or comments. Um, all right, looks like the stream did settle down. Well, I say that and that's all yellow again. We'll keep going. All right, so let's go ahead and jump into the next section here, beginning in verse 37 in the text. By the way, if you do have a question or comment, don't hesitate to drop it in there. We are trying to monitor that, and I'll check our email here in just a moment. But let's start, Brian, if you would, with verse 37, and just read through verse 39. Let's kind of uh, close up this section, and then we'll go on into verse 40. All right. Uh, verse 37, on the last day of that great fe uh, day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out, saying, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. But this he spoke concerning the Spirit, uh, whom those believing in him would receive. For this Holy Spirit was not yet given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> 
So, Brian, this is this is just really big old controversial area, and we're going to really open up the can of worms and just throw them out there and let people go fishing. So, it's interesting the number of times that Jesus uses, not just Jesus, John, in the vision in Revelation, if you look towards the end, what he sees um, in the great city, where there is no temple, for God is there and the Lamb is there. They are the temple. He talks about the, the river of life or the, yeah, flowing from the throne that he sees there. In this case, the point in verse 37, he says, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. That phrase, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water, it sounds like a quote from uh, Old Testament scripture, doesn't it? It sounds like it, yeah, but yeah. you're going to be hard-pressed to find that exact quote. Yeah, your Bible will have different cross-references. It might point to, but it's, it's not quite quoted as, as you know, as, as what we have, are used to with other quotes there. But when he says, as the scripture has said, out of his heart, do you think he's limiting that to Old Testament scripture, what we would call Old Testament scripture? Um, I kind of do, um, but I think you're, it's interesting, as you suggest, could we not be pointing out, um, you know, sometimes what we have are parenthetical statements that because they don't have parentheses, we don't know for sure it's a parenthetical statement. What if John dropped that in there? And that's not quoting Jesus. That's just, you know, Matthew does it, you know, let the reader understand when he's mm -hmm. talking to Matthew 24. Um, John could have just put in there parentheses as the scripture has said, you know, um, you know, that he could, John could be quoting us something else somewhere else. I think that's completely possible. I think it's probably more, my, my opinion is probably is more just the idea. There are a lot of conversations about water flowing, you know, out of Jerusalem. There's prophecies about this. It's a, it's actually a substantial, uh, concept in the old Testament that there would come this time when dry land would be, you know, watered. And of course it, it means that symbolically, you know, and that this water would flow from Jerusalem um, the, all, all the language about Jerusalem, you know, in the, in the prophetic Old Testament, uh, so much of it has this water flowing from it language. So I think, it, mm -hmm. I think he just could be saying, look, the scriptures say stuff like this all the time, that there's going to be waters of living water flowing out of you. I, I think that would be a completely reasonable way of looking at this passage. There, there's even a reference to that. And I think my, I'm getting some of my recent studies confused. I thought it was in Revelation, but it may have been one of the prophecies where it talks about that the, and I think the SV says Niger, okay, it talks about to the south, normally is an arid region would have waters flowing through that. Kind of going back to what you're saying there, Brian, as far as in the, in the imagery there. Yeah. So what was he talking about? Verse 39. Oh, by the way, I got a problem with your statement about maybe John put it in there. It's in red. Yeah, so it's if it's in red, red it's so clearly by Christ. Help, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah but no, that, I, does, I, that does throw you <laughs> off a little. Yeah. So, but what was he talking um, about? Well, that, that's actually also a little bit of a controversy, not nothing substantial, because there's yeah. two reasonable answers he's talking about. Number one, he could be talking about the, you know, in John 14, 15, and 16, Jesus in this book, Jesus is going to talk a lot about the coming of the Holy Spirit. Hmm. I mean, we're told this is the Holy Spirit he's talking about. So it could be that specific coming of the Holy Spirit that he again talks about in depth in John 14, 15, and 16. That is when the Holy Spirit came to the apostles in Acts chapter 2. So that's one very reasonable, uh, and I say that because we know what happens, so we know it's a reasonable conclusion that he could be talking about that. It could also, though, be just talking about eternal life. A lot of times living water is, a, is an expression that we would talk about eternal life, and in Acts chapter 2, verse 38, Peter's going to call eternal life the gift of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit's gift to us. Right. So it could be the idea when he says the Holy Spirit had not yet come, he could be saying that the Holy Spirit's gift of life, you know, that uh, this transformation where we become living uh, living beings because of, because of baptism. I don't think water here is a relation to baptism, uh, but I do think it's the idea of being brought to life through the Holy Spirit, uh, through, you know, our, our, our obedience to the gospel. It could be a reference to that as well, and I think either one of those are reasonable conclusions. Um, I, I, you know, I lean more towards one than the other, but I think both of them. We know both are true, so we could say either one of those could be what he's actually talking. About. 
Okay. You know, there's something similar in Matthew chapter 2, verse 23, after the return from Egypt. It says, and he came and dwelt in a city called Nazareth. Well, it's referring to jo uh, Joseph, actually. That it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophets. He shall be called a Nazarene. Well, where does the prophets say that the Messiah would be called a Nazarene? And so it's not necessarily a statement of scripture, but it may be the essence of scripture in that he would be a, a man of apparent non, uh, uh, he would not be an, an impressive man, a man of apparent insignificance. Uh, and so, you know, it could be something like that. It's not something that is specifically said in the prophets or in the scripture, but basically this was the idea of the spirit of the scriptures and uh, that the scriptures are actually in, in that place talking about the spirit and he, and he uses the waters to illustrate that. And so uh, I'm thinking that's the case. Okay. I'd like to build off what Bob said there. One interesting thing that they do in the New Testament a lot is typically when they're quoting a specific passage, they'll actually say Isaiah said or Jeremiah said or somebody else said. And you see that like in John chapter 1 and verse 23, Isaiah the prophet said, uh, John 12, 38, this is to fulfill the word of Isaiah. Um, that, that they'll say, this prophet said this, Joel said this, you know, so-and-so said this. So I have to wonder if, uh, just like Bob is saying, whenever we see a statement that says the scriptures say it, it's it's referring to a totality or an idea from scripture uh not necessarily saying a quote from scripture um and i kind of wonder if maybe that's meant to be the tool that we're supposed to catch that when it says the prophet's name we know it's a specific quote when it says the scripture it's more of the idea of the concept is found in the prophets but without inspiration don't we do the same thing when we teach we do oh yeah oh yeah, yeah. i do all the I time mean, a lot of generalization you know, the Bible teaches you need to believe and be baptized to be saved. That's not a direct quote of Mark 16, 16, but it's what it teaches, yeah. Well, let me throw a third option, and it may overlap what you just said, regarding the text there in verse 39, where he says, for the Holy Spirit was not yet given because Jesus was not yet glorified. What if he's talking about what Joel prophesied? When he talks about in the latter days, jump forward, I'll pour out my spirit upon all flesh, okay? And so what, and, be, and the reason why I kind of bring that up, the possibility is because he says, because Jesus is not yet glorified, you know? So when Jesus dies upon the cross of Calvary, yes, we know he sends the Holy Spirit to the apostles right on that, about that, but they had already had the Holy Spirit inspiring them before that point. But you have a very specific instance on the day of Pentecost and it's very, it's very, um, very important. But I wonder if this is, could be referencing what Joel said. You know, in those in the latter days or in those days, I'll pour out my spirit on all flesh after the death of Christ upon the cross of Calvary. Just That's good. And of course, well, happens in Acts chapter 2. Right? And there, yeah. been, there is some limitations uh, regarding what they understood Jesus to say. Mm -hmm. Though Jesus was teaching them, they didn't understand a lot of it. And he said the Holy Spirit will bring those things to your remembrance. So that began on Acts in Acts two on Pentecost, yeah. and 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 it went out to others as others began to uh, prophesy, speak in tongues, etc. And as uh, Brian pointed out a while ago, the gift of spiritual life also yeah. uh, was made accessible. Well, do y'all remember Wayne Welsh? Long time ago, Wayne Welsh. He had a, he had an interesting take on the Joel statement in Joel two, uh, Joel, yeah Joel two twenty eight, and then of course Acts to the fulfillment of that. Um, he he made the point that in the Old Testament time period, God pouring pouring out His Spirit upon like Israel could, if I'm representing it right, would symbolize God basically in our terminology in fellowship with Israel, and any time they disobeyed God. He would then withdraw himself from them. And so he kind of, or did hold the position that the idea I'll pour out my spirit on all flesh is simply saying the door is now open for all to come and be a part of his people to whomever is willing to do that. Um, 
But that's, that's, that's not a very common position because immediately the connection is made within what Joel says between pour out my spirit in all flesh and men will dream dreams and so forth like that. Seems to be more of a, a connection with the miraculous side of things. But anyway, just thought I'd throw that out there as a third possibility too. But it is connected with Jesus being glorified. I think that's kind of what's significant there. For the Holy Spirit was not yet given because Jesus was not yet glorified. The apostles had spoken or would speak with the gift of the Holy Spirit. Um, but once uh, the death of Christ upon the cross of Calvary, the full revealing of the will of God would be coming through the Holy Spirit. Yeah. All right. Any thoughts? Okay. How about in the chat room? I'm guessing you agree. Y'all, you agree with everything we're saying. I don't know. <laughs> All right, let's see. looks like the stream has settled down, so we'll, we will keep plowing ahead. All right, let's go ahead and look at the next section. Tom, if you would, let's read. Because we're, we're coming back to that question again. Who is he? And we're going to be talking about another, not really misrepresentation, but a real another example of how people just didn't fully know what the Bible taught regarding the coming of the Messiah. I think... We saw it in part back in 25, because they said no one would know where the Messiah comes from or something to that effect. But Tom, let's go ahead and bring that part into the discussion roughly, starting in verse 40. And let's read through verse 44. It's kind of a short little section there, if you would. All right. Okay. So we read there. Uh, Therefore, many from the crowd, when they heard this saying, said... Truly, this is the prophet. Others said, this is the Christ. But some said, will the Christ come out of Galilee? Has not the scripture said that Christ came from the seed of David and from the town of Bethlehem where David was? So there was a division among the people because of him. Now, some of them wanted to take him, but no one laid hands on him. Okay. Thank you, Tom. All right. Any thoughts about this section? All right. Some, yeah. you know, they were thinking maybe he is the Christ, but isn't he supposed to come from Bethlehem, not out of yeah, Galilee? Yeah, yeah. Uh, there's a lot of interesting thoughts about. It. Well, first of all, he did come from Galilee or from Bethlehem. You know, mm-hmm. I mean, I mean, yeah. th- let's not forget where he was born. And I, I find it interesting uh, why they didn't know that. You know, uh, other than Jesus wasn't going around saying I was born in Bethlehem. I mean, obviously. Uh, uh, by the way, it was recorded. And, and what I mean by that is, why were they in Bethlehem? Because of a census. So there's a, there was a legal, even though we don't have it, there was a legal documentation probably associated with the birth of Jesus on that particular occasion. Um, so you have that that's tied into this. But you've also got the idea of, you know, uh, many in the crowd. The first thing is they see what Jesus is teaching and what Jesus is doing. And they know that he's not ordinary you know they're at, you know some say he's the prophet others say no this is the christ and i wonder uh what's the difference between the pro- the prophet and the christ i mean there's a difference between a prophet but the prophet that they were looking for was also the messiah of course they might have seen a distinction between the two of those individuals uh, but nevertheless they're wondering, is this the one that we are looking for? And that's what the common people are anticipating, even though clearly there is no understanding. But then you have the observation, uh, verse 41, some will say, well, will the Christ come out of Galilee? Well, as we've already pointed out, first of all, he wasn't born there. He was born in, uh, you know, he was born in Bethlehem. So he was born in Judah. However, having said that, uh, uh, you know, I kind of did some research a couple of weeks ago tied to this. Uh, actually, there were a couple of prophets that were out of Galilee. Uh, I, and I guess we I guess we get down that into the next section, you know, as far as dealing with that. But, but uh, there were some prophets that came out of Galilee. I, I think Jonah. Jonah uh, was uh, from that area, Gath Heeper, I believe, was somewhere in that particular region and possibly... Uh, or Nahum uh, uh, from the tribe of Simeon, which would have been in that region. So you do have a couple of prophets. And like I said, we're going to get more into that when we get into the next reading in the next section. 
but the, but like everything else, there's debate about who this is. And and uh, when I look at that expression, will the Christ come out of Galilee? You can't help but wonder, is that those that want to be critical of him? You know, you know I mean, you know, are, are, are these his critics who are who are <clears throat> looking for something to pick apart? You know, you know, something as a reason why they can reject him. And of course it backfires. So anyways, you have it, that. It seems to me that this is the crowd. This does not consist of the Pharisees, uh, the scribes. These are not your scholars. The scholars probably would have tied together the prophet and the Messiah. Right. Uh, but the people might not have because they, they weren't exactly being taught uh, taught the truth in other areas either. And so my thinking is they might have thought there was a difference between the prophet uh, of Moses and the Christ of David uh, and other and, and, and Isaiah. Uh, and they knew that Jesus was from Nazareth of Galilee, but they might not have noticed, known that he was born in Bethlehem. Yeah. Like, common people. Yes, it could have been checked, but these are not people in my mind who would have uh, who would check. Uh, yeah. They would they would just assume that where he was living at that time is where he was from. Uh, but uh, but they did know that Messiah would be born in Bethlehem, and that is to their credit. Yeah, you know, you know, Bob, building on that a little bit, and, and I know that there's a little bit of debate about this or discussion. How literate were the common people? You know, you know, uh, uh, how much were they depending on whoever their synagogue leader was? <laughs> you know, telling them, to, telling them what they needed to hear. You know, uh, not necessarily verifying it, and what little they knew about the law was what they had heard. Maybe it was something that was read. Uh, when they were in synagogue, I, I do know this, that even if they were literate, what percentage of them would have had a copy of the scrolls? You know, I yeah. mean, because mm -hmm. I mean, th that's your secondary issue there is, is the value of books back during that time. So, so th th there's, there's a lot of side issues that, and clearly, and I, and I, I totally agree with you on the point here that this is dealing with this is dealing with the common people who have misunderstandings. Now, I would believe that in the midst of them, that there would be some, some of the common people who believe this. But I also say there's probably, there's probably some Pharisees and Sadducees floating around there, and and I could see some of them poking, trying to poke holes into what the common people were saying. So, so I I I, I see the mix in the crowd. Well, it does say some of them wanted to take him, and that would probably be the yeah. fair. Yeah. So, anyways, yeah. Brian, a couple yeah. of things come to come to mind. Yeah. Uh, first of all, it's very interesting to me, um, and actually, Caleb kind of makes this comment in in, <clears throat> in the chat room as well. He points out that Jesus has three different where he came from, or the Messiah would. The Messiah would be come from Bethlehem. He would come out of Egypt, and there's the prophecy that Matthew mentions in Matthew chapter two that the message would begin in Galilee. Galilee of the Gentiles is what uh, Isaiah says. So there's three prophecies about where he came from. And Caleb rightly says, isn't it incredible? Jesus is all three. He comes from all three in that sense. And it really is a remarkable thing. The thing, though, that I think is the most interesting is, uh, you know, uh, the, uh, you've rightly pointed out, it seems like people commonly knew Bethlehem was the place. In Matthew chapter 2, uh, when Herod says, where's the Messiah supposed to be born? They all say, well, it's supposed to be Bethlehem. Um, but here's what I think is so interesting. John never actually tells the reader, by the way, guys, John, Jesus actually was born in Bethlehem. He doesn't resolve this for us. Um, and I think there's two things to think about with that. Number one, it, it's a, it's a inference or almost a necessary inference. It's almost a necessary inference that John has written his gospel so that his readers have already read the other gospel accounts. Um, that is a necessary inference that the gospels are meant to work together. As you know, that that if John has a piece that is missing a part, and Matthew and Mark have the, and Matthew and Luke have that piece that tells you, those pieces fit together. 
that's the way the gospels are designed to be like four puzzle pieces that lock together and I, I think it's a marvelous testimony that the Gospels weren't written all by themselves. They were written with a mind of these writers together. So John never tells us because Matthew and Luke told us. And John, you know, doesn't even venture that. Otherwise, otherwise John would have left a huge problem in his Gospel if he wasn't relying on us knowing the other writers. But number two, the big conversation in the book of John is where is Jesus from? And it's not about Bethlehem. It's about heaven. Uh, that's the thing he keeps pressing them on. I'm from above, you're from beneath. I am from the Father, you're from your Father. You know, and, and so it's kind of neat that that really is the spiritual conversation we're trying to. Jesus is trying to have when they're when they're saying, well, you know, they're debating. Well, where's he from? Is he from Galilee? Is he from? Well, he's actually from heaven. You know, that's the real answer that Jesus wants them to understand. I'm actually from above. This speaks to the the overall theme of the book of John that Jesus is God. And so it's kind of neat that we also have that division here. And while they're bickering about this, which city is he from? He's saying, well, actually, I'm not from any, I, I'm not from anywhere here. I'm from above. And that would be the bigger answer that he wants us to see. And that's where John started his gospel. Uh, yeah. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. Uh, so the people, the readers, at least, not, not the people who were, uh, characterized here, but uh, the reader would know that by the time he gets to John chapter 7. And so, yes, he doesn't have to tell him yeah. tell them what Matthew, Mark, and Luke have already told him. Okay. All right, good points. Good points. Let's see. We are at about, we got about 15 minutes, so uh, if you've got any questions or comments, we'd love to hear from you. Hey, if you're, if you're on our Facebook page and this is your first time uh, to join us for our study, be sure to, um, what, what do you do on Facebook? Like and yes. follow. That's it. Yeah, like and follow on Facebook. And on YouTube side of thing, like the video if you like it and subscribe to our channel. That way you'll receive um, future notifications um, of our studies. So just kind of throw that out there. And also, I don't know if it's, not, I don't know if it's important, but we don't receive any monetization on the YouTube side or the Facebook thing, you know? Yeah, I know. I we haven't broken that 1000 follower mark or whatever the, <laughs> the limit is, but it means yeah, you don't get least, commercials at, either. <laughs> yeah. At least John hasn't shared it with us. If he, <laughs> yeah. All right. Everybody gets two cents. All right. No, <laughs> no, there's no monetization on it right now. Um, if we get over 20,000 subscribers, maybe we'll really start pushing it. But I like our current, what do we have? 120, 140, something like that. So we're a very tight knit group of lovely people. You're all terrific. So, all right, you so, can be a part of that night tight knit group. That's, that's right. <laughs> all right. Let's see. Um, Okay, David asks an interesting question. Let me throw this in. David Clark, bring this up on the screen here real quick. He says, if Jesus was born in all three places, where was he crucified in what city? It's not so much about, and when it says he was from, doesn't necessarily mean that he was born there, but that he came from. For instance, um, when they were taken to Egypt, all right. And then as you know, Herod died, they came out of Egypt when they returned to Nazareth. Um, you know, that's kind of what he's talking about. Not so much trying to say he was born in each place, but at some point within his life, he came from that area. Not only his life, his childhood. Oh, exactly. Yeah. 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 I, I mean, yeah. And, Going back and to that, the early days. Yeah. That, I mean, um, understand clearly he was born in Bethlehem. Period. End of, end of discussion. But Joseph and Mary were from Nazareth mm -hmm. when they went to Bethlehem. And then, like, and as you pointed, they, oh, by the way, they stayed in Bethlehem rather than going back to Nazareth until they had to flee when they went to Egypt. And it wasn't until after Egypt when Herod was dead that they went back to Nazareth. But, but I mean, uh, it's just the three places. Like I said, if you knew, if you knew the history of Jesus, uh, you you might have known some of those points about him. 
But all these people, all a lot of these people knew about Jesus is, oh, he was raised in Nazareth. And by the way, as far as his childhood goes, you have his birth in Bethlehem, uh, Egypt. More than likely, he was only there a couple of years. You yeah. know, to, uh, uh, that's why Herod murders all babies two years and younger than when Herod dies a year or so later. He spent the most of his childhood in uh, in Nazareth. You know, just just like the, our boys. Our boys were both born in Arkansas, you know, born in Hot Springs, Arkansas. Uh, after, uh, matter, of, yeah, uh, after that, we moved to Florida for a short period of time, three or four years. But then we moved to California, and we've been here ever since. And uh, so, uh, okay. you know, they were raised in California, but they were born in Arkansas. Then they <clears> lived <throat> in Florida. So. So, so someone says, where are you from? You have different yeah. answers, yeah. But, so your boys uh, looked out of the ark and saw what? Exactly. <laughs> they saw, um, They saw. hey, we don't need to, no, never mind. So. But now as to what city he was crucified in, he technically was crucified outside of a city, wasn't he? Yeah, outside Jerusalem. of the city. Yeah, yeah. Um, which is a whole other discussion for Hebrews. Talking about outside the camp and everything. Yeah. Um, Brian, the question you've dropped, do you mean to bring that in through our social? Yeah, sure we can. I just thought it might be something to think about. Yeah, well, why don't you go uh, ahead and we haven't read, we that. haven't read that last We haven't read that last part yet, so uh, uh, we, we can answer it when we get to it. Talking about verse 45? Uh, well, yeah, we haven't read up through the end. So, Well, let's go ahead and jump back to you then, and let's take All 45 right. through 52 since you started this. <laughs> All right, since I started it. Uh, then the officers came to the chief priests and Pharisees who said to them, why have you not brought him? The officers said, no man ever spoke like this man. The Pharisees answered them, are you also deceived? Have any of the rulers of the Pharisees believed him? But this crowd that does not know the law is accursed. Nicodemus, he who, had, uh, who came to Jesus by night, being one of them, said to them, does our law judge a man before it hears him and knows what he's doing? And they answered and said to him, Are you also from Galilee? Search and look, for no prophet is arisen out of Galilee. Everyone went to his own house. Oh, there it was. The last verse, verse 53. Sorry. All right. So let's go ahead and talk about that, Brian. Okay. I just think it's really neat um, that it looks like, and I, and I could be reading this wrong, but it looks like, they're planning and plotting back in verse 30 that they're going to uh, uh, do this. And in verse 32, it says that she, the Pharisees heard the crowd murmuring and they sent officers to take him. But verse 37 seems to indicate that's days before. So in other words, Jesus is speaking. Uh, they send officers to arrest him. Several days later, this last thing comes where these officers return what? That's kind of a strange, go arrest this guy, and, and a, a bunch of days later they come back. I wonder, you know, a couple of things come to mind, what it might be. I'm just curious what everybody else thinks. What might be the uh, reason for the delay? You know, why days later before they came back? And I think, like I said, there might be more than one answer here, but uh, that was the question I was wondering about. Well, who wants you know, to take this? I don't know. I hadn't thought about it, so I don't have any. Well, I've already got, like I said, I, I think there's two possibilities. Um, okay. One is, um, well, it isn't until verse 37 that Jesus actually speaks very openly. So there's the possibility that they just can't find him. You know, they're looking around and finding him. But I think, I, per, I prefer to think, I should say, that's a very distinct possibility, that he hasn't spoken openly at the feast until the last day, and then he's going to disappear again. And that kind of fits a model where we see Jesus has been very... He's prominent for a moment and then vanishes uh, because they're trying to kill him. You know, be, you know, and this is his time. Is it come? That's one of those seven time come, time not come statements of John that we saw earlier. So, you know, that could be a very straightforward answer. But I prefer to think they've been listening to him for days um, because when they come back, they, you know, I, I, I just this is one of my favorite. I wish I could have seen it moments in the Bible where those guys come back and they're just like, yeah, you should have heard what this guy was saying. I, you know, 
if the police was sent, say, we need you to go arrest this guy, and they come back and say, wow, that where is he? Well, we couldn't arrest him. He was incredible. You know, he was he spoke amazing things. You know, you would be so frustrated that you can't even get your own soldiers to obey you because when Jesus starts talking, they're caught up in this. I want to think maybe they've been caught up for this for days. Well, we'll get him tomorrow. Let's listen some more. And tomorrow comes, oh, we'll get him the yeah. next day, but I want to hear more. I can't help but to wonder if they're not, because they are at the end drawn into Jesus and they can't arrest him because of that. And I wonder if it's been days that they've been drawn into Jesus. And you, you those Pharisees are saying, where are those guards we sent? Didn't we send them out a couple of days ago to arrest him? And and then they finally come back and, you know, they're they're caught up and Jesus is speaking. And I I love I love to think about that. That's one of those it, um I wish I could have seen that moment. It could be but a twofold. You know, it yeah. could be that they were that because of the crowd kept interfering with them, but them standing there doing the very thing you're talking about, questioning whether or not they should. Go ahead, Tom. Sorry. Yeah. I, well, yeah. You know, building. That's a great point that Brian makes. You know, it's interesting. They're sent there for the way we would use the term is to arrest him. You know, you remember, an arrest does not mean you're guilty, but there's a there's suspicion that you're guilty of something. They arrest him and then they come back said man, this guy is not guilty of what you're saying he's guilty of. Uh, or, or, or he's not guilty of what you're accusing him of. So why should we arrest him? You know, I mean, you, you've almost got a little bit of that in it. So it's a good point you bring up there, Brian, in, in looking at the way that is. So. Caleb brings up an answer where he kind of sees it as they they just can't catch it, you know, which, which again, makes sense. And I like especially what Caleb says, where that's why Judas plays such a critical role I can tell you where he's going to be, when he's going to be there, kind of engagement for them. So I do think that that's an interesting point too, Caleb. Um, that it does that 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 makes Judas's um, work in betraying Jesus a little more critical into figuring out how they how why it's so important, why they didn't just grab him some other time, like Jesus said. Especially since they were they were afraid of doing it in the daylight, and so. Judas tells him, I know where they're going to be tonight. <clears throat> and I can identify Jesus in the dark. I'll kiss him. And uh, and so yeah. they wouldn't know the Jesus from the earth, some probably. But uh, Judas uh, definitely would. Okay. Um, let's see. So the latter part of this then, the Pharisees, they, they hear the response of the soldiers there. And they question the soldiers, are you, aren't you also being deceived? You got a bunch of ignorant people out there who don't know the law and they're cursed. And that's why they're listening to him. And then Nicodemus' statement has always been interesting. He comes to Jesus' defense quite simply, does our law judge a man before it hears him and knows what he's doing? And their reply is, are you also from Galilee? Uh, elsewhere, don't they, and in one of the other gospels accounts, don't they ask him, aren't, are you one of his disciples too? Yeah. Um, and so they say, search and look for no prophet has arisen out of Galilee coming back to, to that misunderstanding or lack of knowledge there. They themselves are the ones who are really accursed because they don't know. Yeah. Um, so Brian, you, you made me think of something and I got distracted when you were talking about the imagery earlier, I could kind of see the soldiers say, Hey, Hey, aren't we supposed to arrest that man? Yeah, but he's interesting. Listen to what he's saying. I know, but we're supposed to arrest him. Uh, there's too many people around. Let's just wait until another opportunity, you know. And I hey, like John, to think that they kept hearing him. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, as you were going through those verses, uh, yeah, you skipped over verse 48. This isn't a criticism, but it's just interesting to note. Have any of the rulers of the Pharisees believed in him? Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And there's two of them. There's at least two that we know of, and and very likely there might have been some others that were just not as bold as Nicodemus and later on of uh, uh, Joseph of Arimathea. Well, Jesus himself says, or maybe it's the right the gospel writer. Anyway, makes the point that there are many others who believed, but they feared yeah. because they they, they feared. Yeah, Nicodemus says we. He says, we know you are a teacher come from God. That's Nicodemus' yeah. opening line to him. Yeah. So, oh, I, yeah. so I assume he's saying, and of course it could just yeah. be him and Joseph of Arimathea, but I think it's probably saying there are a few. But what I think is more interesting 
is Nicodemus doesn't jump up here and say, wait a second, guys, I believe in him. Um, I think that they're they're all afraid because John 9 will tell us why. If yeah. you confessed Christ, you're out. You know, that was their agreement. And why, why would you agree with that? Well, I think the agreement was, and, and how many churches do this? We'll talk about this when we get to John 9, where you say, hey, we don't talk about controversial things around here to keep the peace. So if you start talking about controversy, you're out. Um, that seems to be their solution to Jesus. We just don't talk about that here. You know, and, um, you know, and so whenever they say that, it's interesting that Nick and Eman doesn't say, wait a second, I believe in him. They're yeah. all kind of cowed down, it seems like. In some there are churches who don't talk about controversial things. Really? <laughs> uh, it, it does happen where, you know, hey, we, we have, we keep the peace around here, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Be careful what you're saying, John. We don't want to upset our audience. Yeah, yeah, yeah John, you might be upsetting yeah, what are the you audience. Doing? What are you doing, John? Go ahead, Tom, uh, Tim, yeah. Tom, Bob. <laughs> Did, yeah, you'll get it right in a minute. <laughs> yeah, <we'll be> right. <laughs> Did any of you ever, uh, I know maybe Tom and John hear of Irvin Lee? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Preacher of the gospel, died several mm -hmm. years. He was, he preached a meeting in Chattanooga years ago, and he said that he went to one congregation and they said, uh, you know, one thing we don't want you to preach on is premillennialism. That's a really a hot topic around here. And he told us, he said, what they needed was a good lesson on premillennialism. And I <laughs> <laughs> oh, absolutely. He, absolutely. He wrote a book, didn't he? he wrote, written, our book was written about him. Oh, well, that was, uh, yeah, I think there was. I can't remember I the can't name remember of it. Now, but. Yeah. Not the same as the Texas preacher, J.D. Tant, but it's a one wow. about Irvin Lee himself. Irvin Lee wrote the book, uh, Do All Roads Lead to Heaven? Okay. And of course, he answered that in the negative. But I do want to point out here before we get uh, wrapped up and I forget it. Mm -hmm. If you can't reason, ridicule. And this is what yes. inevitably happens in a religious debate where the man who has the truth makes an argument that is so clear that it cannot be defeated. And so the other guy just ridicules him. And that's what happens with reference to the lawyers, I mean, the, the soldiers and, uh, and Nicodemus. If you can't reason, ridicule. You also can get a little, uh, so, uh, yeah, that's a common Please. practice. Yeah. yeah. That's a good point. All right. Well, that's about the end of our study. It's now 1201. Let's plan next Thursday to pick up with John chapter 8, verse 1. We've made progress. John so are we going to, we going to uh, include the adulterer pericope? Peri 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 that's not even in the new American standard. You know, uh, let's, discuss, let's discuss that at the beginning of the class. Okay. Yeah. That's why those of us that are scriptural preachers use the new King James. That's right. Yeah. I think it's a good discussion. Um, there are abuses of the text, even, you know, let's say going with the aspect of it being there, there's still abuses of the text we could look at, but you're right. There are some who, don't um, include this within the their manuscripts. Not many, though. Isn't it just a small number that don't include it? Yeah. yeah we we'll talk about it next them, week. Most yeah. of them preface it as a footnote. So. Yeah. Okay. Good discussion okay. and one to look forward to. Yeah. All righty. Well, listen, well, we want to thank you for joining us for our study today. We really appreciate your time and attention. If you do have any questions, you can always send them to us at a later point. Send them to questions at truthfactorlive.com. We'd love to hear from you, hear what you have to say. And if it's something we can bring into our study and talk about, we will most certainly do that. All righty. Well, that's it for this week. We'll see everyone next Thursday at 11 o'clock a.m. Central Time. Right back here at truthfactor.com or Truth Factor Live on Facebook and YouTube. Y'all have a wonderful week. Bye-bye.